This is the sixth video in the Couple Oscillators series. So far we have looked at couple oscillators in the context of a couple of rather simple systems, just two masses really coupled in a couple different ways. What we have not done is try to connect what we've done so far to real applications, and this is a, a good time to do so. So it turns out that uh, a great deal, a great majority of mechanical systems that are, you're interested in for various reasons are characterized by an equilibrium position and then possible vibrations around that equilibrium that you're interested in, in, in for various different reasons. And uh, often those systems can be very complex and what we are doing here offers us a way to figure out what those vibrations actually look like even when faced with a very complex system. In fact, the uh, methods we are using here have applicability uh, well beyond mechanics. In optics and quantum mechanics, for instance, a very similar calculations can be performed to figure out how optical modes travel down uh, fibers or how uh, electrons behave in, under certain kinds of confinement, for instance. But we'll stick for now to uh, mechanical systems, and I'll give you two examples that are particularly important. Uh, so the first of those is that of a molecule. So a molecule, uh, we can see as just this kind of ball and stick figure is actually a pretty good approximation of what, what it actually is from a mechanical point of view. We have the mass concentrated in the atoms, and then they are connected with springs to one another that normally are drawn statically, but in reality uh, allow oscillations of the atoms relative to one another. And uh, it's these oscillations uh, that we would like to be able to calculate and that the, the couple oscillator method allows us to calculate. For uh, a molecule like this, uh, or even much more complicated molecules, uh, the frequency, the eigenfrequency of, the, of these modes uh, are very high, typically in the range of infrared light. So one way to characterize what the uh, oscillation modes of molecules are is simply by measuring its absorption, light absorption in the infrared. Uh, one can also use a, a different technique known as Raman spectroscopy, which is was also an optical technique, but that looks at inelastic scattering of light from molecules. Either way, you have a very powerful way of identifying molecules based on their vibrational spectrum, which is largely unique uh, to a specific molecule. Uh, an example at the opposite length scale comes from uh, civil engineering. Whenever you're building a large structure, like a bridge for instance, uh, one of the things you need to know is how does it behave in an earthquake or in the presence of winds or, or uh, vibrations induced by trains or, or whatnot. And to understand this, uh, it becomes necessary to be able to calculate the vibrational modes of the structure, which of course is, is very complex. But if we can describe it, uh, we can in principle calculate what the eigenfrequencies are of something like a bridge using the same techniques that we have outlined here. Now these are of course much more complicated systems and the simple two or three dimensional systems we have treated here are, are not going to be adequate. You will need a computer in order to calculate what the frequencies are, but uh, this can be done with great efficiency and the technique is essentially the same as what we have seen uh, up to now. Now to look at a complicated system like this, uh, typically what you do is you work with a set of uh, generalized coordinates. So the system is described by generalized coordinates. We should say that the configuration of the system is described by generalized coordinates. Uh, and we will have a number of these, right? and we can put them in a vector. So we have the vector Q, which consists of generalized coordinates 1, Q1, all the way through qn, right? And the dimension of this can be position, but it can also be other things like orientation or direction or even curvature. Um, it doesn't matter, as we've seen previously in that, as you know quite well, 
the Lagrangian method works no matter what these uh, coordinates actually stand for, as long as you can write down the kinetic and the potential energy of the system. In the case of the molecules, that's pretty simple to do. The uh, generalized coordinates are probably just going to be the positions, the relative positions of the atoms, and uh, that's all you have to do. When you're dealing with something like a bridge, it gets more complicated because you have members here, which have mass that's extended over uh, some distance. So you might need to specify not just the position of each member, but its orientation and perhaps how it's bent to, so its curvature comes into the play there. Either way, the Lagrangian method works the same and is built on the, our ability to write down the kinetic and the potential energy uh, and then proceeding from there. And that's what we're going to do now. In fact, we already know how to do this, but what we're going to do is specify a general approach that allows us to move directly from the expression of the kinetic and potential energy to the K and M matrices that we need to solve in order to find the eigen eigenfrequencies of the system. And oh, if it's not clear here, the word I'm trying to write here is curvature. Curvature. Okay. okay. So let's start with the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy T. Uh, if you have a system that consists of particles, we know quite well what that is. You just take all the particles, you index them 1 through n, and the kinetic energy is just going to be 1 half m alpha r alpha dot squared. And this vector here is because the position of the particle uh, needs to be known in three dimensions in principle. Now we have already shown, uh, if you look back in your note to... Uh, uh, the derivation of the Hamiltonian, for instance, that we can write this in terms of the generalized coordinates uh, on a similar form. And that would be something like this. We have one half, and then we sum over k, let's say, which goes over all the degrees of freedom of the system, which is going to be smaller than, of course, than the total number of particles in the system. And we have some matrix here. Uh, actually... We're not just summing over k, we're summing over i of and j. So a, I, a of i and j of q, all the q's, multiply q sub i dot, q sub j dot. And another way to do that in matrix form would just be say that that is one half K transpose, uh, Q transpose, excuse me, matrix A times vector Q. Really the same thing on, on matrix form. Uh, and A depends in general on the configuration, uh, but uh, we are going to assume now that the dependence of A on Q, the configuration is slow. So A just changes slowly with configuration, at least near the equilibrium that we're going to examine. So this is now a function of both vector Q and vector Q dot, and it's a function of vector Q through A. A depends on the Q. So the Lagrangian, which is what we're after, is the kinetic energy depending on both Q and Q dot. And then we have the potential energy, which in a conservative system is only going to be depending on, uh, on the uh, uh, coordinates, on the positions. Next, we're going to assume that we're working near an equilibrium. Okay, so we are working near an equilibrium. And in the context of, for instance, the bridge or the molecule, it's pretty clear what that is. Uh, we have some point where the total potential energy is minimized. And uh, that is the point of the equilibrium. And we can define our generalized coordinates without any loss of generality, such that the equilibrium happens when all the Q's are zero. And that will simplify things a little bit. 
Okay, so what we're going to do next now is to take the Taylor expansion of the potential energy. So we're going to Taylor expand it. So U of Q is now going to be U at zero, because that's where the equilibrium is located. Plus the sum over uh, du dq sub j times q sub j. That's the first order term. And then we have the second order term. Which is then one half the sum over uh, d to u over dk sub j, dq, dq sub j, dq sub k times uh, q sub j, q sub k. Okay, this is a, a Taylor expansion around the equilibrium. We know that we can set this equal to zero, um, if we like, because we can always redefine the potential to be zero wherever we like it to be. This is equal to zero because we are at an equilibrium or we're expanding around an equilibrium, really. So the first uh, term that survives is this one. Now, there are, of course, higher order terms, but we're dealing with small displacement from the equilibrium, so this is the one that dominates. And this gives us the result that the potential energy as a function of Q near the equilibrium can be written as approximately one half the sum over j of k, j and k, times uh, the quantity k sub j k times q j uh, q k. We can write this on a matrix form if we like. So that's one half vector q transpose matrix k vector q and this works if we take simply that k sub j k is just this derivative here right like so and this is now a quadratic form in the q's so potential energy has taken on it and directly quadratic form in the Q's. Next, uh, we'll do the same thing to the kinetic energies. So the kinetic energy T, we already know that that is equal to Q transpose A of Q or Q dot transpose, excuse me, Q dot. Now we can rewrite this, if we like, as approximately equal to Q dot transpose times the matrix M times Q dot transpose, uh, times Q dot, where M is just equal to this matrix M at the equilibrium point. There. The next step is now to calculate uh, Lagrange's equation using this potential and this kinetic energy. And that involves, of course, calculating uh, the following quantities. We have d dt, and then we have to take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the q sub i dots, and that then has to equal to the Lagrangian, derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the Q sub i's. Now, uh, if we look at the Lagrangian, it will, in this form, depend, uh, well, it, it's equal to t minus u, but in this form, t only now depends on the q dots. That's because of the simplification we've made. We have replaced a, which in general depends on the configuration on the vector q, with the matrix m, which equals the value of a at the equilibrium point. 
So this uh, Lagrange equation in, in this particular case really becomes So the task now comes down to calculating these two derivatives, the t, the q sub i dot, and the u, the q sub i. So we'll start with the q, the u, the q sub i, uh, and that's just this. And this derivative has two terms uh, that are non-zero, one when j equals i and one when k equals i, uh, because then those terms actually contain q sub i. Um, so we will then get first when, when j equals i. And then when k equals i, now we know that uh, the matrix k is symmetric. k sub i j equals k sub j i. We can show that if you go back and, and look at how we derived k in more detail, but a uh, simpler way is just to say that, well, we know that the eigenfrequencies that we get in the end are going to be real. That means that the matrix of which we're taking the eigenvalues must be symmetric. Otherwise, you wouldn't get real eigenvalues. So this has to be true. So these terms are actually the same uh, because we can just replace uh, ki with ik and then call k over here j. And we'll then end up with... So that's our result. Uh, we get a similar result for, for this derivative, just for the same reason. And just with those two results, we can now write down what the uh, Lagrange equation looks like in general. Uh, what we'll get is just simply where we get a double dot from this. Um, this time derivative here, or on matrix form. And from there we know how to proceed. Right? This is the same result that we had before, and then we can take the, uh, um, find the eigenvalues from this by, by positing uh, harmonic solutions, just like what we've done before. The interesting part, though, is that we've been able to write down, that we are able to write down the M and K matrices here uh, without solving Lagrange's equation, or, or without even writing down the Lagrangians, because we know what the Ks uh, and the, uh, uh, the Ms are, the members of the Ks and the M matrices. They're just calculated directly uh, from the potential and directly from the kinetic energy. This A at zero is just part of the um, part of the expression for the kinetic energy. So in other words, this just gives us that K minus omega squared times M scalar A equals zero which gives us the uh, 
eigenfrequencies and the modes. So that's the method in general. Uh, now it's applied to a problem. Um, but since we've only taken quite a lot of time in this video, that will be done in video number seven, which follows next.